everyone, and welcome to the first Cauldron of the Year. And to, tonight we have a very special guest on the Cauldron, Sinead Watson, who has become quite famous in the world of gender ideology as she has detransitioned. So we're going to talk to her about her experience and um, what she's doing now and how she's helping other people. Hello, Sinead. It's nice to have you with us. How are you and how's New Year been treating you? It's going very well. Um, well, technically not because I quit smoking. So I've been very angry <laughs> and I also promised to remain sober for January. So I've also been very bored. But other than that, things are going very well. Thank you. So Lisa, do you want to start off with asking some questions of Sinead? Hi Sinead. Um, I just wanted to know what, um, what was the lead up to you transitioning? What were you going through that made you feel like you wanted to transition? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it was more than one thing, um, and I'll sort of go through that with you. So um, I wasn't a trans child. I didn't have dysphoria as a child or anything like that. And I, you know, I, I spoke about that with my gender clinic and they were like, well, when did the dysphoria start? And I said, you know, my teens. Now, it wasn't gender dysphoria I had as a teen. That's what I proactively labelled it. What I had was a very normal discomfort that teenage girls have when they develop and they start to receive a lot of very unwanted negative sexual attention. Um, but in the years leading up to my coming out as trans, there was a lot of different things that happened. The first was um, three reoccurring uh, unwanted sexual things that were happening. And the other part was uh, realizing that I was also sexually attracted to women. So um, in my head, I sort of came to the realization that, you know what, I hate being a woman. I really feel like I shouldn't have been born this way. Um, if I'd been born a man, you know, all my problems would be solved. And that sounds really simple, but the big change was when I went online, when I was, you know, I was on Tumblr, I was one of those, and I was on various forums, I was watching a lot of YouTube videos, I was in contact with a lot of older trans people. And yeah, it, it was the internet that tipped me over. Prior to that, uh, when I was a teenager, it was just I hate being a woman. I'm not very girly. I'm attracted to other women, you know, all that. And then I went online and it was like, actually, have you heard of transition? Have you heard of gender dysphoria? The distress you have is gender dysphoria. Your desire to be a man means that you were born wrong and actually you can become the man that you wish that you were. And so it was really getting sucked into the online trans space where people tell you, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, the depression you feel, the suicidal ideation you feel, all these other terrible things. If you transition, that will solve your problems. And I fully believed it. I bought into it entirely. So Sinead, when you were on social media, um, who was who were the influencers? Were, were they men as in trans women or were they women as in trans men? Um, that, that you found out all this information from? Initially, it was trans women. So when I was just Googling things like, um, I'm a woman, but I wish I was a man, or I think I was born in the wrong body, or things like that, you know, I would go into forums like Susan's Place, or I would go into Tumblr blogs or vlogs, and it was all trans women. Um, the, the Tumblr blogs in particular were trans girls. They called themselves trans girls. So you assume that they're your age or they're younger. Um, it eventually did come out that they were not trans girls. Uh, they were middle-aged men uh, who frankly had some fetishes. But for me, like when I was specifically looking for material, I saw a trans man material. So most of the stuff that I was um, consuming during that time was trans men, AKA trans identified females. But the initial pull um, was trans women who called themselves trans girls. The script was, um, I was born this way. I remember feeling this way for as long as I can remember. I remember being three years old and tearing my dress off. It's bullshit. 
that that's a script that you're fed very early on. Um, it, it really is bullshit. Obviously, yeah. there are some legitimate cases, but we understand gender dysphoria is incredibly rare. And for the longest time, it mostly affected middle-aged men. There was none of this teenage girl stuff. It's very, very rare that that happens. And so the script that they were fed was, if you're going to go to your clinic, tell them you have felt this way for as long as you can remember. Tell them that you were a tomboy who was distressed by girly things. Tell them when you were in high school that you hated dresses and long hairs and, and all the rest of it. And then that will help convince them that you need testosterone. But the reality was when you actually befriended them, when you actually spoke to them, they were like, oh, yeah, uh, my dysphoria didn't come about till I was 17. And uh, I joined trans space. Well, I was a perfectly normal kid. Um, mm -hmm. Or if they actually do believe it themselves, like maybe they were a bit of a tomboy, like so many normal women are, but they've been wrapped up in the, the trans ideology. So they go back and say, do you know what? I wasn't just a happy trans boy. I was a distressed little boy trapped in a girl's body. That was really common. And I went through something very similar to that, where, you know, as I've told you, I had a very happy childhood. I was a tomboy, but I wasn't distressed. I wasn't bullied for it. My family didn't shame me for not liking girly things. But after I began to identify as trans, I actively went back and I was like, oh, the fact that I was a tomboy is one more symptom or sign that I was trans. It's phenomenally common that I would struggle to believe that, it, like, no, I think every single young female who has come out as trans over the past six to seven years knows these scripts, have been fed these scripts, and regurgitated these scripts to their clinics. I am convinced of that because I've seen too much proof of it. Do you think it was gender dysphoria or do you think it was trauma based? You know, it was a reaction to trauma. And maybe, I mean, if you say you were attracted to women, was that something that was sort of viewed positively within your family and within yourself? I mean, I'm still conflicted on that because I was diagnosed by a professional with gender dysphoria in 2015. So what I had whatever you want to call it, met the criteria. So technically, and just what I was diagnosed with, I had gender dysphoria. The problem is um, we understand gender dysphoria to be something that you're either born with or something that just naturally wakes up within you with no catalyst. Whereas my, quote, gender dysphoria, if that's what we're calling it, had a catalyst. So either gender dysphoria is no longer what we once understood it to be, or I didn't have gender dysphoria and I was misdiagnosed and mistreated by my clinic. <clears throat> so um, I don't think what I had was gender dysphoria in the classic sense. I think that it was a response to trauma. I think it was, um, you know, I had other body image issues. If it was nothing to do with my sex, it would just be body dysmorphia. Um, but because I had the audacity to say it's also linked to my sex, the dysmorphia that I had was labelled dysphoria. So that's um, it's rather convoluted and we could sit and go back and forth about that. But I think the vast majority of the cases that are being diagnosed with gender dysphoria today, it's not gender dysphoria. It's, it's something else that strongly resembles it. Well, it's strange because, you know, I was I was gender non-conforming when I was a kid and I, I've never really spoken about this before, but I will tell you, for a period in my teens, I never said it out loud, but I was convinced I was asexual because I wasn't interested in dating, I wasn't interested in sex, and, you know, when I was 16, 17, 18, there was uh, boys or men my age who were asking me out and they were, you know, they were good looking guys, funny, smart, <laughs> they got along. And I just wasn't interested. And my friends were like, why won't, why aren't you interested? Why don't you just give them a chance? And they couldn't really fathom why I just wasn't interested at all. And so behind my back, not in a bitchy way, um, but behind my back for many years, uh, it was the assumption that I was a lesbian. My sister thought I was a lesbian. My mum, you know, thought I was, they all thought that I was gay. And I just, 
I never thought about sex or men or women like that throughout my teens. It just wasn't in my mind. And then when I was about 18, 19, um, I had a few gay friends and we went to a gay bar in Glasgow and I saw the most beautiful human being that I'd ever seen in my life. And I was like, oh, and it was a woman, you know? And so I came out as a lesbian when I was about 18 or 19 and everyone was like, no surprise, no surprise there, blah, blah, blah. But then there was also that weird undercurrent of, you know, it not being normal, you know, I, I won't be able to give my parents grandkids. I won't be able to give my sister nieces and nephews. And then I remember, you know, in the jobs that I was working, um, if people would say inappropriate things like, you know, uh, are you single? Can I get your number? Blah, blah, blah. And then you say, oh, I'm flattered, um, but I've got a girlfriend. And just the hostility and the sneers that you would get. I remember when I, I had a long-term girlfriend when I was 22. And I remember when we used to go out to bars together and stuff like that, she was very feminine presenting. Like she was a very beautiful, stereotypically feminine girl. And um, while I wasn't typically feminine, I wasn't butch. So we just looked like a pair of two young women. And the amount of times that men took it upon themselves as a challenge, to come over and, you know, try and do stuff with us and then get aggressive when we said, fuck off, we're together, leave us alone. Yeah. So, but yeah, by the time I was in my early 20s, I was out as a lesbian and the whole thing, I was constantly made to feel that I was either lying to tease men, that I just hadn't found the right man, or that my girlfriend was going to leave me for a man because she was just too feminine to be a lesbian. So though it had nothing but negative connotations. And then because of what we, we were calling my gender dysphoria, unless I was very drunk, I couldn't be sexually intimate with my girlfriend. It was too distressing because of my body. And so for me, it wasn't this beautiful realisation, this coming to realise who I was and what I wanted. The whole thing was just distressing. And so when I found trans material online that was like, oh, that's normal. You're just a trans man. I lapped that up like it was mm. nothing else. It answered all your all your questions. And can I just ask, when you say that you um, think you were asexual, was that after the abuse? Somewhat. The, the worst of the abuse didn't happen until my, my late teens and like in the years directly leading up to the trans identity. But I mean, the first couple of horrible things that happened was when I was about 14. And after that point, I think maybe it had something to do with it. Maybe it didn't. But after that, I associated sexual um, attention with negativity I just wasn't into it and you know you're at that age your friends are getting boyfriends and they're having the first kiss or they're losing their virginity or they're all those sexual things that happen between the ages of about 14 to 16 or, or did in my group um I I just I didn't care and I wasn't interested and it wasn't that it disgusted me it didn't disgust me it just didn't interest me yeah I think you know in, like for myself I was quite late I didn't have really interest in sex until I was very late teens and so I did it so I don't think that what you know like not being interested in sex at 16 or 17 is that unusual I think it's just there's so much pressure these days on girls uh, to be very sexually available from quite a young age and I think that that's one of the, the problems really that we have so I think that what you were saying is you found being female was a is a challenge for all females puberty is a challenge for all females sexual attention is a challenge sexual your own sexuality is a challenge because a lot of it is you know you get mixed messages like you're not meant to be sexual <laughs> or you know like you are meant to be sexual so did you find it was actually you wanted to escape from the female experience and felt the males had a had a better experience in my later teens definitely 
you know, it was because, you know, before I came out as a lesbian, I did have sexual experiences with men, um, some of which were consensual. And, you know, it was always when I was hammered drunk. And the like today we could look back and say, he should never have slept with you when you were that drunk. That was just wrong. But back then at the time, that was just normal. People went to house parties and got fucked up or people went to the pub and got wasted and slept with someone. And that was just normal. But I kind of noticed that the men who were doing that were studs. You know, they were players. They were being men. Whereas the women that were doing it, they got a new vision on them where it was like oh you're easy how dare you have gotten so drunk at that party and worn that short skirt and so I saw the, the way men and women were treated even though they were doing the exact same thing but it was you'd look at it and you'd go if I had to choose between how I was treated I would take how the men were treated I didn't like what I was seeing with regards to women and although it didn't happen in my mid-teens that would eventually develop like during my trans identification days, I genuinely had some misogynistic views. Um, and that's not something that I'm proud to admit, but I might as well be honest with you. And it resulted from a lot of the things that happened. Okay, okay, I'll give you a direct example. Um, we used to have regular house parties when we were in our late teens. And a very, very good friend of mine got incredibly drunk and passed out at one of these house parties. She had the audacity to be wearing shorts when this happened. And so a man at the party assaulted her while, while she was blackout. And I wasn't at this party, I should say. I found out about this after the fact. And I contacted a female friend of mine who was there. And I was like, what happened? And she was like, oh, you know, so-and-so got drunk and led this man on. And now she's calling it something else because she regretted it. And so in my head, it, was, it wasn't even just the men that were being pigs. I saw the nasty side from some women as well. And it, it gave me some very nasty thoughts and opinions, I think, along with some personal experiences as well. So you, um, when you, you were reading about the Trav's ideology, and this was like, we can solve your problems. So then what happened? Did you did you go to the clinic or the doctors? How, what happened next? Well, it went for a few years because I found trans material when I was about 20 to 21. Um, so not a teenager. And I was convinced at 21 that I was trans, but I was too afraid to come out and I was too afraid to transition because it was very new. I'd never heard of gender dysphoria or transition or anything like that before. Um, so instead, I would religiously read trans blogs and I would watch their YouTube videos and I went deep down the rabbit hole. <laughs> you know, people are constantly talking about studies and research. You'll find no more knowledgeable person than someone that went down that rabbit hole. I saw things that the current situation that we're in does not surprise me. It makes perfect sense. If you go down that and you see that the vast majority of these young, they call themselves trans men, these young women who are coming out, you would be flabbergasted to learn how many of them are addicted to porn and how many have eating disorders and how many have a whole host of other issues. The mainstream trans community doesn't talk about that because it looks bad. But when you've been in those spaces, you see it. Um, so, I mean, I saw all this stuff, but I was pretty much playing the, I'm not like the other girls. So I was reading about all this stuff and I was like, well, that's not me. I'm a true trans person. You know, I'm just going to ignore the abuse and the assaults that I've suffered. I'm just, I'm a real trans person. And so eventually, um, it was my relationship with my ex-girlfriend that was the final push. When I realised that after everything, I couldn't even be soberly intimate with the woman that I loved at the time. I was like, okay, I need to go to the gender clinic and get some help. So I put myself on the waiting list in 2014 when I just turned 23 years old and I waited for a year and then 
2015, one after the other, very, very quickly, it was evaluation, diagnosis, testosterone, happened very quickly. So were you offered counselling? Not during the waiting period. So the waiting period for me was 12 to 13 months. Mm -hmm. During that time, you just wait for the phone call. So do you think if you had been offered counselling and you'd got, obviously you'd been able to speak about your past experiences, do you think if you had been able to speak about that with someone, do you think you would have realised that it wasn't the fact that you needed to transition, but the fact it was maybe something else? I really do think that because it wasn't like I was aware that I was traumatised. I wasn't, you know, to me, like... I, I was brought up and told that thinking of yourself as a victim is weak. You know, you life is hard. You need to power through and you need to get on with it. And so even though victimhood has become this really trendy thing today, it was anathema to me when I was younger. And so, you know, when I thought about all of the horrible things that happened, it was like, I'm over it. I'm just not going to think about it. It's fine. And I think if I'd sat down with a therapist who was like, actually, um, that was a very horrible experience. It's obviously still stuck with you. It's given you all these issues, these body issues, these trust issues. We should talk about that first before you go on cross sex hormones. But they, my clinic was very affirming, so that wasn't an option. Therapists are not, you know, they're not doing their job. They're not actually finding out the root cause for this. And then affirmation therapy look where that leads people I mean you know you had a double mastectomy and you know I mean I wonder if you could give us your thoughts on on having that surgery you know how tough was it afterwards and things like physically and mentally I mean it was strange at the time because um I couldn't get the surgery in Scotland I had to travel to Manchester so I travelled down to Manchester General Hospital in 2017. Um, you know, they checked me, to, ironically, to make sure my breasts were healthy enough to be removed. Um, so you go through all your, your regular checks. And then I went to, down the day before the surgery and I was in a bed and next to me was a trans man who just had the surgery. So, you know, they had the, the tubes sticking out of their sides because you get the draining bags. And I was kind of looking at that and I was like, okay. And then I went in for my surgery. I woke up after it. I couldn't feel my chest at all. And it's such a bizarre thing. Like, you know what it's like when you sit on your arm and it goes numb, but you know the feeling's going to come back. It was just, it was so strange to wake up and just there was no sensation on my chest at all. And I had these tubes sticking out of me. And initially there was no pain. Um, but then there was, and um, I couldn't sit up. I couldn't administer my testosterone chop myself, so a nurse had to do it. Um, and then they, they pull your drains out. That's very uncomfortable. And then they put some plasters on you, and you walk to the train station and go back to Glasgow. <laughs> you know, that's just that was how it was. And I was told to take it easy for six weeks. Um, so I came home. And I had to I had to take a lot of painkillers because even though my chest was completely numb at the scar site, there was a lot of pain around the scar site, if that makes sense. I was very swollen. I was very bruised. Um, and then I came home and I couldn't lift my arms above shoulder level. So my mum had to come around and take everything from the tall shelves and put them down. And um I got a call from Manchester General and they were like, you have to come down to get your dressings removed. And I was like, can I just go to my GP or a nurse up here? And they're like, no, you have to come down here. It turns out they wanted me down there so badly so they could take an after picture. So they took a before picture of me. And then after the double mastectomy, they wanted me down there for an after picture so they could put it in their big book. Now, their big book is all the results that they show you before your surgery. So when I went down, um, it was huge. It's this big book and they go through and they show you this is probably what your results are going to look like, you know, aesthetically, as you would expect. But I have since spoken to four, 
four other detransitioners who went to Manchester General for their double mastectomies and their results were atrocious. They didn't make it into the big book. So that's um, some transparency, I think, showing your patients what might happen rather than just the quote, good looking results. And also naming what it is, not just saying it's top surgery, you know, I mean, a double mastectomy, I mean, I, I've had a double mastectomy, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And I had reconstruction as well. So I had a massive scar from thigh to thigh. It's really hard and they just do not let children or young, I mean, really far too young, removing healthy tissue like that it's just all wrong I, I can't believe they're doing it and making sure it was healthy before they did it which is just I, I was just going to ask you another question um you know when you took your first shot of testosterone like did you what sort of changes did you feel did you feel like emotional changes like obviously there would have been physical ones as well I assume they would have taken a little bit longer to happen but how did you feel like inside yourself when you started taking especially the first shot of testosterone the first shot didn't do much, if I can remember. So I, my testosterone was called Sustenin 250, and it was to be injected every three weeks. Um, so the first shot didn't really do much physically or emotionally. Well, emotionally on the point where I was just at the time happy to have got there because I'd spent so long wanting the testosterone. Um, it took a few months, and I noticed that I had more energy uh, I required less sleep. I was more motivated. For so long, I'd been wanting to, you know, get back to the gym and go out for runs. But I just, I was too tired all the time. But then I had all this energy. Um, so it's like, I've heard people refer to it as euphoria. I don't really like that word for transition. Um, but certainly, like, my energy levels spiked. I felt so much more willing to do the things that I wanted to do and it wasn't until several months in that I realized I pretty much lost the ability to cry. Um, I, I lost a member of my family during that time and I couldn't cry, I just got angry and I was never an angry person before, you know, if I got angry before testosterone I'd like cry into the pillow for a little bit, that was as far as I took it, but I mean I, I like broke my knuckles punching things while I was on testosterone it was just I wasn't used to the exaggerate exaggerated levels of emotions that I was feeling and the numbing of other emotions it was I saw it as a good thing at the time because to me you know crying and being vulnerable was a woman's thing you know whereas being strong and angry was a man's thing that's that's how messed up my head was at the time. And so when it was happening, I was like, yeah, like I'm becoming the man I was supposed to be. That's how I felt at the time. Talking to my mum and my sister and my best friend, they were like, you became an arsehole. Like you became so confrontational, so angry, so bitter. Like I, a lot of friends walked away from me during that time because I just, I wasn't the same person. And that was the thing where, my line and a, a, a line that many trans people repeat because you see it online all the time is I'm still the exact same person I just look different I'm still the exact same person I just have a different name you're not the exact same person the hormones change you and I didn't understand that at the time but sitting talking to my loved ones and they were like you snapped at me for correcting you one time you know, you were just angry all the time. The way you spoke about women was just completely different. And the whole time I was like, oh, I'm exactly the same. I wasn't. And it's not until you really look back and have to admit what you were doing and what you were saying that you go, holy Jesus Christ. It, the testosterone dramatically changed my personality and it took me a long time to accept that. Is testosterone what um, bodybuilders take? Is it like is that a steroid? Is that what? Yeah, it is? yeah, it's a steroid. Because they that, that happens to like bodybuilders as well, doesn't it? They just can't control their anger. Can I ask him? Did you think you would become a man? 
did you actually think you would become a man? Not literally. Um, I would when I was a trans man, uh, or calling myself a trans man, I was true scum. So I wasn't, you know, neck deep in sort of trans ideology or anything like that. I would often get referred to as a true scum or a trans medicalist, which basically meant I, I understood that I couldn't change my sex. I was stuck as a female. So in my mind, it was like, I know I'll never become male, but if I can pantomime it well enough, if the testosterone in the surgeries allow me to trick people into thinking I'm a man, that will be enough for me. Evidently it wasn't, but I held that belief for a good few years that, you know, if I, I, I started going to the gym again when I was a trans man and I was using the men's changing rooms. And at the time I remember being like, well, I'm, you know, they don't know, so it's fine. And then I remember walking in and I was sitting there and I had my, my gym bag and this weird feeling of discomfort came over me where I knew I was lying. Like, don't, like, I, I think a lot of trans people do where, not all of them, you do have some truly delusional cases, but when you're in situations like that, when you understand that you can't change sex, I remember being there and it was fine, like, if you were getting on the train and the guy asking you for your ticket was like, young man, have you got your ticket? Or if you were buying something at the shop and it was like, oh, son, have a good day. And it makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. But you know that it, it's an act. You're tricking people. You People think you're a man, but you're not. And that kind of eats away at you for a while, but the validation feels really good. So whenever people would use male pronouns for me, because I pass, testosterone does that. Trans women don't pass most of the time because they, they had natural levels of testosterone at a young age. But for women who take testosterone, a lot of the times you can pass very well with testosterone and surgery. But you still, or I did at least, you find yourselves in situations where you're like, they don't know that I'm tricking them. They don't know that I'm not actually one of them. And there's this weird satisfaction and being able to succeed in the pantomime that you're putting on um and I'm saying that bluntly obviously I didn't think about that at the time because I was just like oh you know I'm trans but you look back now a lot of it was just you enjoyed being able to successfully deceive people because it meant that what you were aiming for was working it was like you'd achieve that goal if you know what I mean was it tiring living like that? It became tiring. Um, the first couple of years went by very well. Um, I was absolutely, like, I used to, I can't believe I used to say this, but I used to walk around being like, transitioning saved my life. If I hadn't transitioned, I would have killed myself. I said that to people. And I suppose a part of me actually believed it. But then, you know, the years go on, and you men don't need to stick a needle in their thigh every three weeks men don't need to think about when they're going to get the next surgery men don't need to worry about getting pregnant if they have sex men you know you very very quickly realize that you still have a lot of the same concerns that you had as a woman and all you are you're not a man you're a woman taking cross-sex hormones and getting surgeries and not every trans man comes to that realization and some of them come to it and accept it. But for me, I kind of reached that stage where the walls came in and I thought, what have I done? You know, I've, I still had all the baggage from the assaults and the depression and the intrusive thoughts and the memories. And it turned out that cross sex hormones and surgeries didn't magic any of that away. It just pushed it down. And so I got to 27 years old. It was round about my 27th birthday. And I remember just sitting there and thinking, you know, why am I still so miserable? Why hasn't the testosterone in the surgeries fixed all my problems? And it's like, it should have been obvious at the time. And it is obvious, but it, I was in so much denial at the time, I wouldn't allow it, where it was like, 
You know you've got all these mental health problems. You've been in and out of psychiatric wards and hospitals for suicide attempts. Did you honestly think that altering your body was going to make your mental health problems go away? And so I think for me, the honeymoon period, the novelty eventually wore off. And I found myself sitting there almost five years into transition thinking, fuck, what have I done? What has been allowed to be done? And that was the beginning of my detransition. And how soon after the double mastectomy was that? I got the double mastectomy in July 2017 and realised my regret anywhere between January and February 2018. So about six, five, six months. Quite Which, quick. you know, speak, speaking to other detransitioners, that's very common. Um, with the surgery, within the first year, a lot of the, the women that I speak to detransitioned within that same time frame. Did you consider phalloplasty? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted everything. I wanted the hysterectomy. I wanted the phalloplasty. And the last time I was at my gender clinic, I haven't been back since 2017. Um, and the last time I was there, I said to my gender specialist, uh, when can we start talking about the hysterectomy? And he said, will you go for your top surgery, i.e. your double mastectomy? And then you come back and then we'll start talking about the hysterectomy. Um, but I never returned. So that didn't go any further. But if you'd asked me during my transition how far I wanted to go, I wanted everything. I wanted all of the available surgeries and I would have went for them if I didn't have my awakening moment when I did. When you decided that you wanted to detransition? The period between me regretting transition and me actually initiating the detransition by ceasing testosterone was a period of about a year and a half. Um, I was very, very afraid to detransition for, for several reasons, and we can talk about that if you want, but it took me a year and a half to cease the testosterone. And I had no idea when my period would come back, if it would come back. And then it came back maybe about four, four months after ceasing testosterone, and it was the most agonising period that I've ever had and I don't know if that was just everything waking up again for the first time but I nearly called an ambulance I was in agony um that eventually did it's it's I get periods every month again and it's fine now you know so but that was scary because no one ever told me what would happen when I came off testosterone the therapists didn't want to talk about it my GP didn't know what to say to me and so when I came off testosterone everything that happened I was I was on my own. And so when my period came back, it was very heavy. It was very painful. I thought I was dying. Like I was panicking. I'm calling my sister up like in tears, like I need to call an ambulance. And she was like, what did the therapist say? And I was like, they didn't say anything. Um, so I kind of learned from firsthand experience what physical detransition was, which was what prompted me to go online and seek out other detransitioners. You know, I created my Twitter account. I followed a bunch of people who identified themselves as detransitioners. And I was just like, what else is gonna happen? And I've experienced very, very, very slight breast growth and, and on one side of my chest. I didn't know that was gonna happen. I was told all the tissue was cut out. So that was something that I learned out of the blue. And then the mood swings, I mean, I suppose it would make sense that when you go on testosterone, you get the mood changes. So naturally coming off testosterone should come with mood changes, but they were, they were nuts. Like I was just inconsolable for days for no reason. My mood was up and down and I felt like I was losing my goddamn mind. And no one prepared me for that because no one wanted to speak to me because I was detransitioning. So I spend a lot of my time now talking to younger detransitioners about this because they're not getting it from their clinics or their doctors. It was almost like going through puberty again when you came off the testosterone because obviously you're on about the mood swings and stuff. And I remember when I was going through puberty, like, you know, any girl knows your hormones are all over the place. Like, you know, somebody drops a plate and you're in tears. So... It sounds like 
Yeah, I mean, it probably was. I don't have any memories as a teenager of breaking into tears for no reason that often. So it was like an exaggerated period um, where, you know how normally if, if you're a bit hormonal and something happens to piss you off and maybe you, you have a little cry, that's fine. But when I came off testosterone, I could literally just be sitting on my couch. Nothing was happening and I would just break down into ugly sobbing tears not knowing why I suddenly felt so emotional out of the blue and then 20 minutes later I felt fine I'd never experienced mood swings like that before and it scared the shit out of me I thought I've properly messed up with my system am I going to be like this for the rest of my life how long is this going to continue for I didn't have any answers were your family supportive like when you transitioned and when you detransitioned they were um externally they were supportive of my transition because they didn't want to push me they wanted to keep an eye on me because very shortly before i attended the gender clinic i was hospitalized on a psychiatric ward for a very severe dissociative breakdown and so when i told them look i'm at the clinic now i'm transitioning even though in their minds they didn't support it, they were very concerned about me. They were hyper aware that they didn't want to push me away. So they said they were supportive when they weren't. This, this all came out after detransition, um, where I've sat down with my mum and my dad and my best friend, and they were like, we were terrified. Of course, we. why would we support you doing this when we could clearly see it was a trauma response? Of course, we didn't support it. Um, and then with detransition, the weird thing was, you would think that when I, for example, told my sister that I was detransitioning, that she would have hugged me and been like, oh, thank Christ. Like, no, she she was very diligent because in her mind, she thought, I'm not going to show happiness that she's detransitioning in case she changes her mind, retransitions, and then says, why were you so happy about me detransitioning? So the first I would say six to eight months everyone was just very cautious very quiet very neutral and it wasn't until about eight nine months in where people were like sort of walking around me like you so the detransition thing's going good and I'm like yeah actually I'm the happiest I've been in a long time and that's when everything started coming out where they were telling me how much I changed on testosterone how much I scared them how how appalled they were that I was given such quick access to cross-sex hormones and that I would be referred for surgery when I had a, a very long and colourful mental health history rap sheet. They were just, they were flabbergasted by the whole thing, but they were very happy that, that I made it out the other side because they told me for a while they didn't think that I would. Are you getting help now for, for the trauma that caused this and your mental health problems? Are you getting help now? No. Um, I know that there are a lot of good therapists out there. I know that there's a lot of good psychiatrists out there. Um, I will never be able to look at the field the same way. And I've worked very hard. I'm not doing it by myself. You know, I've got my family, I've got my partner, I've got my friends, I've got the, the numerous other detransitioners that I'm in contact with, so I'm not doing it alone. But my, my ability to trust the mental health field has forever been tarnished because of what I went through. And even when, you know, friends and family were like, please just try therapy one more time, I can't. I can't do it. And look, I... I, I'm an advisor for Genspect that has, you know, Stella O'Malley and Sasha Ayad and things like that. They're, they're very, I think they're very good at what they do. Um, but I personally couldn't turn to mental health professionals again, not after what happened the last time I did it. And do you find the work you do now with the detransitioners, do you find that helps you? Oh, the, it's been the most helpful thing that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can... You can, I can sit and talk to the three of you and you know a lot about this stuff. You've been in this circle. You've spoke to all these different people. You're a lot more knowledgeable of this than like most other people who just like, what's well, a detransitioner? You know, you know about these issues. 
but there's something very special about being able to sit down in a group chat with 30 other detransitioners who know exactly what you're talking about. You know, if I say, um, you know those intrusive thoughts that still happen every now and again that tell you that you were born wrong? I could say that to someone who isn't a detransition, detransition and be like, what do you mean? Tell me about that. Whereas other detransitioners are like, I know what you're talking about and this is how I cope with it. So being in this group with all these other women, some of them only took testosterone, some of them went even further and got the hysterectomy. So all these different experiences, but the one shared thing is transition regret. And to be able to speak to other people who know exactly what that feels like and they're not gonna judge you and they're not gonna tell you how you have to feel has been the most cathartic thing that I've ever experienced. And I owe my healing process to every other detransitioner that I speak to. I was just wondering if in the future, um, Sinead, that you might think about becoming a therapist because perhaps there is a need for therapists who really truly understand what these young people are going through. They need, they need someone. So is that something you might consider in the future? A lot of people have suggested it. Um, I try not to go into too much detail about the support groups that I'm a part of, um, just because it, it makes some detransitioners very antsy. They're very, very particular about their privacy and their anonymity. But I mean, I spend, Jesus, I spend more time in one-on-one -on -one conversations with detransitioners than I do working with Gen Spect or the GDA. And I'm basically playing therapist, but I always say to them, you know, I'm not a therapist, I'm not qualified, I can be a shoulder to lean on and I can be an ear to talk to, um, and if you want it, I can offer advice. Most of the times they don't, most of the times they just, they need someone to listen, you know. Um, if becoming a therapist would make a difference, it's something I would consider, but in my experience, most detransitioners are not going to therapists. Um, they're too jaded by what they've experienced. They're going to other yeah. detransitioners, and um, which is fine. I won't talk too much about it because I'll get emotional, but sometimes you get very young detransitioners who are talking about they, they have got the urge to self-harm again, and they've started drinking again and starving themselves again. And um, sorry, I am going to get emotional. Um, and seeing like all these things where they're talking about suicidal ideation and you log on the next day and they haven't got back to you and they don't get back to you for several days. And you spend those days terrified that they've done something silly. Um, and then they do get back to you and they're like, sorry, you know, I just had my own stuff to go on. And it's so difficult sometimes to be in contact with so many people where whenever they go quiet, your fucking heart jumps into your throat because you don't know if they've done something. And you you beg them to go and get help, but then you feel like an asshole because I know damn well I'm not going back to a therapist. So why am I telling this fucking kid to go back to a therapist? Um, so I'm, I really, I'm working with Genspect and the GDA and a few other people to try and get support networks and um, things like that put into place for detransitioners because they really need it. Yeah. A lot of them are in a really bad place and they've got nowhere to turn to other than people like me and I'm not a qualified expert, so I don't even know if I'm fucking helping them. Um, so I'm, I don't think you need to. You are qualified because you've been through it. You know, um, I think being an advocate and bringing this out into the open is so important because it seems to me that a lot of um, these children that want to detransition are terrified to, to talk about it um, mm -hmm. because of the backlash they might receive. Um, and, you know, we need to talk about this. It is difficult. I mean, I'm so sorry that you're upset you know you're probably making us all upset too but it's so Sorry. important <laughs> it seems to me that you're taking on an awful lot on your shoulders you're taking on these people and that you're speaking to in your counseling it's an enormous burden for you 
it's, I think you must be like just like an incredibly, incredibly strong person to be able to do what you do. <laughs> and it happens to sound like my complete admiration and that you're somebody maybe only has you to turn to at the moment. And that must be just a huge responsibility for you. I, you know, do you take care of yourself enough? Have you got um, hobbies or things that you do to kind of self-care? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, last year I did, um, my vice is drinking, and it always has been, and last year, um, I lost my job last year because um, I was in a car crash, no one was hurt, but I lost my car, and my car was my means to work, um, so when I lost my job, I started drinking more, and I saw myself going down that route where, you know, I know exactly where that route leads because I've been there before, and I was like, no, I'm not doing this. Um, but I, I did just catch myself there. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start going for my runs again. I'm going to start going for my hill walks again. Um, I'm learning fire spinning, which is really fun. And I do my writing and, um, you know, I listen to audio books and I tend to plants and things like that. So I've got, I've got ways to deal with it, but it's, it's learning to curb your addiction to social media. Because I, you know, I took a social media break over the Christmas period um, where I didn't really post anything, but I was still on it, checking every day. You know, and my partner's like, what the fuck are you doing? You said you're taking a break. And I'm like, I'm just checking the messages. You know, <laughs> like, you, I need to, I and everyone else needs to learn that you should have social media and just internet free days at least once a week. Oh, yeah. You know, and I understand that if you do that for a job, that's difficult. But if you get yourself, like especially for me, in this sort of D-trans um, circle online and stuff like that, all it takes is one message or one tweet where you see that someone is struggling or something bad has happened for you to go into a panic, put everything else off and sit with your face in front of that screen. So for me, um, taking care of myself is taking one day a week off social media and going outside and talking to real people rather than usernames. <laughs> yeah. And so, your, your writing, some of your writing is very poignant. Um, and I was just wondering about things like TED Talks, you know, maybe therapy might not be the right thing, but there are other ways to reach people, you know, that maybe public speaking and um, advising therapists on how to treat detransitioners you know educate these these people um you know I worry a lot about social workers who are affirming these children mm -hmm. schools that are affirming children you know they're talking about head teachers you know deciding um to use pronouns and treat the child as the opposite sex without parent parental knowledge and things these people are not qualified to do this, you know, and I think that's, we need to reach those people and tr somehow try to reach the general public and let them see exactly what's going on and how damaging it can be, you know. I will say, um, well, we all know that Scotland is, is um, doing this absolute nonsense with the GRA with regards to very young children. Uh, I can't name them. Um, because I haven't met with them yet, but I am meeting with someone who has a voice in that conversation, who has agreed to speak to a detransitioner. And so whenever I get opportunities like that, because I've done public speaking, I do advise for groups. It's not because I want to, it's because, you know, who am I to sit here and cry about how little help there are for detransitioners if I won't do something myself? So I... I do a lot behind the scenes that I don't talk about uh, like on Twitter and things like that because it's not why I do it. And so my hope is if um, a couple of the plans that I have in my head right now for 2022 can come to fruition, then we will see more support for detransitioners, but we'll also see more critical coverage of what we're doing to children. The fact that there's any idea that a 12 year old can self ID is disgusting. And uh, 
I'm sure all three of you are in the exact same boat as me where you're you're talking to people and you're doing things and you're making movements because this can't go unquestioned. You were sold a lie by this industry, this gender industry, this gender ideology. You were told it would make you better. <laughs> it's just, it's obviously it's not going to make you better. I, and the problems are just compounded by by being sold a lie. And that's what we're doing to children. I admire what you're doing enormously. I admire your courage of being able to speak out. I admire that you've been able to take what happened to you and it's sublimation and, and channeled it, channeled it. Do you know what it is though? I think it's because um, I'm not old, I'm only 30. I'm about to turn 31, mm -hmm. um, but I am old compared to most other detransitioners. You know, most of the detransitioners that I speak to are 19, 20 and 21 years old. And so I think I've got a, a protective instinct for them where, you know, if it was a bunch of people my age, it'd be like, oh, you know, we're all in this mess together. But, you know, I transitioned in, in my 20s as an adult. When I speak to a detransitioner who tells me they were put on puberty blockers, who tells me they were put on testosterone at 15, who tells me that they were uh, given the double mastectomy at 18, who tells me they were given the hysterectomy at 20, I, it's this horrible but powerful feeling that I get where all of my problems disappear. And I'm like, okay, this is not on. It's not on. This this person is far too young. This shouldn't have happened. I can't believe I'm talking to a 20-year-old who transitioned further than I did. How am I talking to a 20-year-old that had a hysterectomy? Like this. It's, it's outrageous. My my anger and my indignation has completely overthrown any grief that I would feel at this stage. And that's pretty much what's propelling me at this stage. So. Yeah, I, I don't cry over it. I don't lose sleep over it. I'm not grieving anymore. I'm too angry. You're channeling your anger to good. Using I'm a mama bear for all the D-trans girls. <laughs> I can't believe how brave you are. I can't believe everything you've went through and you, you're you still like putting other people first. I just think that's an amazing thing to do. Like, oh, I thank you. Um, I just want to like thank you guys for having me on because like, I know that your your faithful audience will probably enjoy it, but there's always someone out there that likes to come on and hate on women talking about things that affect women and hating on detransitioners. You're probably going to get that, for which I apologise. Um, but other than that, I will say that I am currently working on um, things that we're going to be doing for Detrans Day of Awareness. It's on March 12th. So we well, we're working with Genspect. We're going to have a webinar. We're going to have a variety of different detransitioners on talking about things. And so, um, if you're interested in Detransition Day of Awareness, then March twelfth, Genspect, and hopefully see you then. Thank you very much for um, coming on our show, and um, and uh, and thanks everyone for watching this episode of the Cauldron. <laughs>